Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 114 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. I'm excited about the episode today because I have three very interesting and insightful professors with me to discuss longevity and staying on the mat well into your years. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but let's start with a quote. You want to be training your whole life. 1% of people that train jiu-jitsu will get their black belt. Where are the rest? If you get too competitive, you will not last 10, 20 years. Hedron Gracie. That quote fits nicely with our subject today. All right. With me for the discussion today is Professor Keith Owen, Professor Greg Nelson, and Professor Mark Cookrow. Professor Keith Owen, also known as the Rhino, lives in Boise, Idaho, and is a third-degree black belt under Master Pedro Sauer. Keith also holds black belts in two other martial arts and has worked in law enforcement as a sheriff's deputy and as a handgun and shotgun instructor. He's a highly respected and sought-after seminar instructor and is the leader and founder of Team Rhino. Professor Greg Nelson is Pedro Sauer's first black belt and one of the world's best and most successful MMA coaches having coached three UFC champions, including Brock Lesnar, Sean Shirk, and Dave Manet. He's a former NCAA D1 wrestler at the University of Minnesota, six-degree Muay Thai black belt, modern Army combatives level four instructor, and a full instructor in the Inosanto Kali and June Fan JKD concepts, among others. Professor Mark Kukro is also a black belt under Pedro Sauer and is the head instructor of Integrated Martial Arts Academy in Harrisburg, North Carolina. He's an accomplished martial artist and has been training in many arts for over 25 years. Some of the styles of grappling that have influenced his jiu-jitsu include judo, sambo, catch wrestling, and shuto. Mark is also a highly successful public speaker with frequent speaking engagements throughout the U.S. So very excited to have these guys on the show today to talk about this important subject. So I know you're going to enjoy the discussion. After the uh, discussion, stick around for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now, without further ado, let's talk to the professors. Okay, I have the honor and pleasure to be speaking with Professors Keith Owen, Mark Cookrow, and Greg Nelson. So welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to talk to me today and be part of this discussion. All right. I'm excited. All right. That's what I like to hear. So the topic today is staying on the mat well into our years. So as the spirit moves you, just jump in and and, uh, comment how you'd like. So I'll just start us off with a question, and then we'll uh, go from there. So we can't really be on the mat long term if we quit jiu-jitsu. So why do people quit jiu-jitsu, guys? Well, I'd say probably a big section of people quit jiu-jitsu because they get injured. Mm. They go too hard. They're not sure what they're doing. The upper belts aren't taking care of the lower belts. Uh, Any number of reasons. But I think a lot of people end up bowing out maybe because they, they do get injured when they're rolling. Yeah, I think uh, injury is 
absolutely uh, a cause of it. And also just personal frustration, like when people get involved in jujitsu, um, you know, you hear a lot of things, I want to get in shape, or I want to get in shape before I try jujitsu, and jujitsu is what gets you in shape. But people have an expectation that I think is a little too high, and they judge their progress based on everybody else instead of just how much better they're getting from a week or week to week or a month to month or a year to year basis. And they expect very often to be able to do things as easily or have them come to them as easily as someone that may be half their age. And it may be the case for some, but for many, it's not. And people have this self-imposed level of frustration, especially as they age with their abilities. And I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, just to trailer that, I, I agree. I agree with these two of that uh, injury plays a huge role in it. Uh, but I think personally, this the deck is stacked against somebody coming into jujitsu for the very first time, because it's not even just injury. Although th again, that's important. I mean, it could be your job that you have. Um, maybe you have a family that you have to hang out with, and and maybe uh, your significant other doesn't want you to go to class as much as you would like to. Uh, and then again, top that off with injury. Uh, then your significant other saying, "Hey, we can't afford this. Why are you doing this? You keep getting hurt. We don't want you to come." It could come down to money issues too. So there's several different reasons, and and but I think again, getting hurt is one of the most important reasons. Yeah, I, I mean, it's from my perspective, it is, it's a combination. It's absolutely, you know, just your lifestyle. If you have, say you have children or say you're 20 years old, 25, you get married, you have kids or, or you know, you just, your relationship changes or your lifestyle changes as your kids get older, they require more attention, more resources. And as parents, we're very accustomed. Most, most parents are accustomed to sacrificing for their children and they kind of forget about themselves. And, uh, there's kind of like a martyr approach to it, which I understand, I have kids, but um, it's easy to just kind of steer yourself away from it. And uh, I think that's something that a lot of people um, battle and have a challenge with, for sure. I think also if you don't have a, an avenue going into your school, which they can gradually and progressively develop, then it's really frustrating, like you said, it can be really, uh, there's a higher level of potential for getting hurt. If, if all of a sudden someone's coming in, they may be a little older, they haven't done anything for a long time, or sometimes they've never done anything really athletic, and all of a sudden they're going to start jujitsu and they get thrown in with the wolves, and next thing you know, they're just getting smashed, or they're getting bruised, or, man, they've never even had a sore muscle in their life, and everything is sore. So you got to have a very progressive way to develop your students, and uh, I think that's a, a really important aspect of keeping people on the mat is that they do feel that there is a progressive development. They do feel that they're, they're getting better and they can go home and feel better about themselves and not feel like, man, am I going to be able to do this? My elbow hurts, my, my hip hurts, my whatever hurts. Yeah. I think that's a big, a big part of it as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree. It's assimilation, like mentally, physically, emotionally. You can't just um, have a jump all in or baptism by fire approach to okay. jujitsu, especially for people that are older and they're trying it. Uh, I mean, 100%. They've got to come in. And they got to be safe. You can't just be like, hey, this is your first class. Uh, you've never done anything. Roll. And they, I mean, you're just setting them up for failure. We got to set them up for success. So, in talking about injuries, guys. What are some of the strategies to prevent injuries? Is uh, How important is being choosy with whom you're rolling and uh, how much of that falls on the instructor and how much on the individual student? Well, these guys said it just perfectly. You need to set the, these guys up for success because if their, their self-esteem starts to go, wow, I don't think I can do this. I'm not very good at this. There's just another reason why, why they are out the door. And it, I think it uh, behooves us to set them up for success, like we were talking about, and get them to a place where they can they can not just get killed, but start out easily. Uh, well, let, let's take, for instance, my school. Uh, I try not to have new students grapple. And, and, and I know that I'm talking heresy to some people. Well, what do you mean, new students grapple? At most schools, they come in, uh, they learn how to stand up in base, or they learn one move, and, and like I said, thrown to the wolves. 
And we can't have that. I mean, that that paradigm is done. We need to be able, I don't care where you start. I care where you finish. And I want you as a black belt. But to start out, we got to start out slow. And the, I, I got to tell you, I think the worst guy that there is, is the dude who um, had glory days. He was a wrestler or he was doing something. He's middle-aged now. But he, in his mind, he still thinks he's 21. He comes in there, oh, yeah, I want to grapple. I hear that. I want to grapple. I'm ready. And we go, are you sure that you want to grapple starting out, man? Just take your time. No, I'm ready to grapple. He goes and grapples, gets killed, and then I don't see the dude again, right? Because, again, Greg said it in the morning. You are like, you can't feel your arms. You feel like you're in a coma or you're paralyzed, and you go, wow, I'm too old. This isn't for me. we got to start off slow. Yeah, we have uh, at our school, we have our foundations program, which we do absolutely no live grappling in there. We do. Amen. They do techniques. They they will do drills. They'll do maybe some like situations where all you do is okay. One person's going to try to get away from the mount. You just got to hold them. But very simple progressive drills until they start to assimilate. Until they start to feel comfortable and they know what to do and what not to do. And even in my then our, our more advanced classes, our cap classes as we, as we call them, now. I, I'm very, very proactive in, in setting up partners. And then the other thing I'll do is I, from the get-go, we have this philosophy, blue belt, you take care of the white belt. Purple belt, you take care of the blue belt. Blue belts are, are uh, brown belts, you take care of the purple belts. And, and black belts, you take care of everybody. Nice. And, and I don't want to see, it doesn't matter, a, a black belt or a brown belt should have enough confidence to allow anybody to do whatever they want to them, but still know that, hey, I know who I can go hard with, who I can go easy with, and who I have to allow to do things to me. And that's something that we have really tried to foster in our in our academy. Yeah, I think it's very, I mean, you know, especially if someone listening to this is an academy owner, I would really ask successful academy owners, people that have, you know, one, two, three, four hundred 400 students, I know you guys do, but um, we do something similar, and I think most of us do. It's a two-stripe rule. And the basic idea is you assimilate, you know how to move, and if you panic, you don't go into a submission incorrectly. So you at least have some idea of what's happening to your body as you're doing this. And, I mean, really, what is one or two stripes? Now, if someone comes in and they have experience, okay, you can get at it. Go ahead. But um, to echo and build on some of what you said, if you own an academy, your first – and foremost priority is to put people in a safe environment where they can come in and grow and get better. And uh, the, the days of them getting eaten alive and that's how it is, that is not going to grow uh, jujitsu and it's not going to grow confidence and esteem in people. So they got to know at least how to get out of most situations and they, they have to know how to tap. And the higher belts, to me, are com absolutely obligated to take care of their training partners because if they're just ripping through them, they may injure the best training partner that they ever had before they got a chance to become that person. And uh, so I, I think it's very wise, especially if you're listening to this and you own an academy, that you take some kind of responsibility for setting the tone in the academy because everything that happens on the mat is a direct result of leadership. And if it's good, it's a good direct, it's a good result. If it's bad, that's also a direct result. And uh, we've got to make sure that we know people that are new are rolling and for the first couple of times, like doing positional sparring, isolation drills, whatever, with people that aren't going to crank something on too fast. And then when they stop to panic under pressure, then they start to become a little more poised and they can move better. So if you own an academy, I would really, uh, you know, looking back, I would have definitely started doing that too. And I think we've all learned over the years that that's a really wise thing to do um, for the safety of our students and the growth of jujitsu. Yeah, and let me add let me add on to that real quick is that if you're a student, let's let's say you're you're not a school owner, you're a student, you know, you yeah. know, well, why do I why do I really care, man? Because I want the toughest guys in there and you've yep. got to be tough to survive. And that's just the way it is. And we don't want anybody who's weak coming into our school. The problem is this if you only want tough people coming in, what's gonna happen is 80% of the students that come in are going to leave. And then you're gonna be left with a few people. And I wanna tell you this. The worst thing in your school is not to have a, all these students that are killing you, 
The worst thing is to be a, a high level student with no competition whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And as a student, uh, like Greg said, you got to help the person yeah. lower than you to come up. Right. And when we can get a lot of people up through the ranks who are really quality in jujitsu, you will have world class training because all these people will challenge you. And, you know, if you don't have that world class training, you're going to get bored and want to go somewhere else. So the more students that you have that can challenge you, the better. Well, it's not just up to the instructor. It's up to everybody in the school. Right. Yeah, yeah, even, even here in Minnesota where we're, we have a, just a strong wrestling culture and we have a lot of wrestlers in our school as well. And so you get a guy that's come in, he's wrestled through high school, even maybe through college, and they want to jump right in and get after it. We're like, no, you're going to do the foundation course where you don't get the grapple at all. Because you don't know anything about jujitsu yet, and yes. so you have to understand yeah. what's going on, uh, why you're doing it, and like I said, you get a really strong, explosive wrestler, and even though he doesn't know what he's doing, he can hurt a lot of people really mm -hmm. fast. And so our goal is to try to, again, ease them in and and show them, yeah. hey, there's a lot of things here that are, are a little bit different, and hey, if you think you're 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 better than the rest, hey, we got a, a a guy that's fighting the UFC over there. We got another guy that's been this. You know, Sean Shirk was the greatest example. He would allow people to tap him out in training just to make him feel better because he didn't really care because he knew that he could just buzz through him like a complete buzzsaw. But he'd say, okay, here's, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to have you put me in the triangle, and all I want you to do is try to choke me out as hard as you can. And then he'd try to really methodically get himself out of there, not explosively, but really methodically, because his whole thing was, what if I'm really tired? I don't have that explosion anymore. How do I get out of this? So that kind of, that for us really kind of started our whole mentality on that. And so all of a sudden we have guys over there that are really competitive fighters and they're getting tapped out and people are like, well, that guy got tapped out. Yeah, because it's not fighting. It's training. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I really like hearing that that trend. Like uh, I think each of you said, you know, those days are gone where it's just kind of dog eat dog and toughest guys survive because that's not healthy long term, and it also is not good for uh, growing a school or being part of a, a school. People just aren't gonna gonna stay. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you build a deep bench, you can build a great team. You got to build a deep bench first. I liked hearing about the philosophy of taking care of each other, you know, the blue belts looking after the white belts. Mm -hmm. There's been so many schools. I, I was at a place not that long ago, and I was rolling with a white belt. And I, I kind of just let the guy roll on top and just kind of gave up position. And he looked at me, his eyes were wide, like, why would you do that? <laughs> and I was like, obviously, that's not what you're used to here. But, yeah, I mean, if you are better with someone, why not help them grow? And by the same extension, you're growing too. So, All right, a huge thing and, and lasting long term, as you guys know, is, is ego. So where does that ego and mindset both? So talk a little bit about how those fit in and, and what those mean to you as far as staying on the mats long term. Well, I think a, a big part of it is, is knowing, again, this is when you're on the mat, when you're in class, when we're, we are training and there is live wrestling or grappling going on, hey, there's no medals, there's no trophies, there's no cash prizes here. We're just having fun. And our goal is we want to experience as many things as we can in training and learn from those experiences as opposed to I always got to win. I always got to be on top. No, the only goal is that you experience and you learn and you grow. And if you're always trying to make this like it's a, like a death match, you're not going to grow. You're not going to have those training partners. And another thing is, you know, I think, which is so important is that you want to have the environment where people are, are encouraged to try things are encouraged to uh, try the move that they learned and they're not going to get just shellacked for doing it. But you're, you're, there's a good, good give and take. And again, a matching partners isn't really big on this. Sometimes I have a newer person coming in. It's just coming in from foundations and they're going to be rolling. So he's going to be rolling with the people I know that will allow that person to grow. And they're not going to try to show that, hey, I'm, the, I'm the, the baddest blue belt on the mat or whatever the deal might be. And, uh, and so that's a big part of it. And again, I think there's something that you have to start to create in your culture and your academy. We have times and, and we have fighters that train. 
we have levels where guys are really athletic and really going to go after it, but that doesn't have to happen in the class. And those same fighters know that in the class, they want to have the opportunity to train and not have to be worried about their ego. They just want to learn. They want to grow. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from the training partner perspective, there's no, you don't get a medal for being the most stubborn, resistant training partner that there is. I mean, you know, you got, you're there for your own benefit. You're there for the benefit of your training partner. And it should go team, teammate, and then me in that order. And if it's out of order, you're going to have this kind of toxic culture. And, you know, in business, there's a saying, it says that culture eats operations for lunch. And it's true because the culture is the king of your academy. And if you look at grappling, almost all the input is sensory input. And if you limit that by just never even moving and giving an inch, you lack the ability to process all this new information. And you have to, you know, in, in anything, really, it doesn't really matter what it is, but you have to train your mindset, you have to train your skill set. And they're, they're just as important as there's not one that's more important than the other. Uh, because when you're physical, um, you're physically depleted, your mental attributes kick in. When you're mentally defeated, your physical attributes should be there. And if they're both trained under pressure to be poised and they've been in every single position a million times, it's a lot easier not to panic and, you know, and freak out and, and make a big mistake. But, um, you know, I think as things evolve, what's really happening, too, is a lot more science and and really good resources are being uh, applied to jujitsu and how people learn. And you can see the result by, you know, the way people are starting now to build teams and cultures and the training methodologies, methodologies are changing, the teaching methodologies are changing. And uh, to me, it's, it's really nice to see, but there's a difference between training and improving, competing and improving and fighting and improving. And training is not competing or fighting. And if you have, you know, a competitive group, like I know Greg and, and Keith do, but you can have that small group and they can get at it, but it's got to be incremental to a point because you can't go 100%, 100% of the time. And if you're preparing for something and you can pick it up, but, um, the, you know, those guys should never eat the regular class for lunch. That That's not what they're there for uh, because it took them years to get there. It's going to take everyone else years to get there. And um, we have to be conscious of that and put them in an environment that is conducive uh, to their success. And you know, what, what you really think as a person that runs an academy, like what you encourage and what you reinforce is what you multiply in your academy. Um, and knowingly and unknowingly. So if you avoid certain topics, you'll have this negative um, kind of result. And if you address everything, it should be a more positive result. But our job as coaches is to train people and put enough pressure on them and nudge them just enough to grow and get better than they thought they could. And um, so those are, that's my thoughts on it. You know, when I was, uh, when I was a blue belt to purple belt uh, back in 1994, 95, a long time ago, <laughs> I think it was 1894. Uh, <laughs> there was, there was a time, cause I'm a big dude. And there was a time where my ego got so in the road and what would happen was I would immediately. Immediately, when we slapped hands, I would immediately try to push a guy over and make him get me in the guard because I was so worried about winning that I didn't care about anything else. So I ended up in somebody's guard most of the time, and then I would pass the side control, and then I was in side control. I would do very limited things because I didn't want to get it reversed on me, and then I had to be in the bottom. And I kept telling myself, hey, I'll work on the bottom later. I'm just, I got to win. I got to win. And so what, what would I win with? I'd work with, I'd win with Americana all the time. And I'd win with Kimura and just something that was easy because that arm is on the other side of me and I don't have to give any space. And one day, Master Pedro Sauer, our, our instructor, he looked at me and he said, Keith, why don't you play the bottom game? And I was like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay. And I decided right then and there, that I was going to be on the bottom because I knew my bottom game sucked. And I got all the way, almost all the way to purple belt before I had made that decision. My point of it is, is if you'll start and get your ego out of the way, and so you're winning and stuff, that's cool, but work on your bottom game too. Because Master Sauer says that, you know, the school is like a laboratory where you work on, on everything. And eventually you're going to have to get to a point where you're going to need to work on your escapes, how to get out of armbar, how to get out of triangle, where at my level, I literally put myself in a triangle so I can escape. But if you're always trying to do the same old tired, crappy moves that you do just so that you can win, 
you're never you're going to be half a jujitsu person and it's going to take you longer so b- get your ego out of the road and go hey i'll be on the bottom and you know i'll even start on the bottom now and people get mad at me like what are you giving me that for hey dude I always say the lucky guy's on the bottom because I can start working my bottom game and get good at it. And now when I get to the top, I some, sometimes I get bored being on top, man, because I like the bottom so much because it's so challenging to me because I spent so many so much time working on that top game that I regret doing that. And if I could go back in time, I would work way more on the bottom. Thank you, Pedro Sauer, for making me. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, he has a habit of doing just like looking at, <laughs> like knowing with surgical precision what you need to do. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, I was kind of, I think most of us, I was too the same way, too, overly competitive. I got injured too much. And what was interesting is as soon as I stopped becoming like hyper competitive and I started to chill and really start understanding the technical finer points of jujitsu, I got so much better at jujitsu. And, you know, Master Page will just look at you and he's like, Hmm. And he'll just make a suggestion and, and you walk away and you're like, man, I, why didn't I think of that? Or, you know, you, it's, it's, you realize how deep it is when he gives you these kind of insights. Yeah. It was, it's really funny when you bring up those little tidbits that professor Sauer always just brilliantly brings at the right time <laughs> the thing. I'm coming up, you know, I was a all American gymnast, a wrestler, comp- you know, collegiate wrestler. So everything came really fast. Uh, yeah did did things you know i didn't care where i was i was just like man and i remember all of a sudden one day professor goes okay every time you find yourself making a move work because you were faster or because you're more athletic because you are stronger than the person you have to stop right there and say let the technique work for you let mm-hmm. the technique work and i was like all right so every time it like if i was going to sweep because everybody's felt that effortless sweep where it just happens. The guys get across everything. But then we've also felt the ones who are trying to force the sweep. And that's, he goes, right there, you've missed the time already. Missed the time. And so I, he slow down, go back, find it again. Wait for the guy to give you the sweep. And I'm like, all right, I'll try this. And that was when I was a blue belt. And I tell you, it. It brought my technique to another level, a level that I never would have had because I was relying so much on my athleticism and so much on my previous training that I wasn't really allowing the jiu-jitsu to grow. And so as soon as I did that, man, it, it really changed a lot of things. And that came back in, in a million times over when I came back from cancer and I couldn't use the athleticism because I lost a lot of it. My legs weren't working the way they used to. And if I had not trained that way, I would have been S-O-L. I would have been sunk in the water. Mm-hmm. Letting your jiu-jitsu grow, that is exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's big. That's big. I really like a lot of what you guys are saying right now about, you know, not being over competitive or using all your A game all the time or, you know, being really uh, just going all for it because, you know, you could be – you can get to a world-class competition and win and not be that well-rounded. I know people that have just done a couple things just, you know, better than anybody else, and they can impose their will in their game. But you might not always be able to do that. And I've heard Peter on Gracie talk about this a lot, and like you said, Keith and and Greg, putting yourself in in bad positions not only makes your jiu-jitsu more well-rounded, but it's preparing you for that day when, you know, you may not have as much of a choice on where you want to be and then you won't be completely lost because you've spent a lot of time developing that too, as opposed to the ones who can impose their will and only do that. And then when they are getting older or whatever, they're out of luck. Yeah. I mean, when someone shuts down your A game, what game do you have? You know, it's eventually going to happen. And so the being very well-rounded and technically proficient, you can do that for the rest of your life. It's like, and, you know, Master Sao has all these little sayings. It's like, well, if you take – and, you know, if you have attributes, you should train them. So let me – you know, let me just say that. You should – your physical attributes should be at the top uh, – one of the top priorities, you know, for training. But um, it, what happens when you don't have any? If you remove all your physical attributes, are the mechanics of your jujitsu like, precise? That, you know, do you have good jujitsu with when you take the attributes out? And then the answer the, – to me, the answer should be yes. So then when you put physical attributes on top of it, uh, it's a whole different level. 
but as you age and your physical capabilities start to slowly decline or you know change then you still have really technical jujitsu that you can take with you to the grave absolutely so right on. let me just say this uh if you don't uh, master sour always says that like if you're if, if you are athletic and you just keep using your athletic jujitsu that works good when you're 21 22 yeah. i mean you can get away with that no problem uh but as you get older, I mean, that athleticism is going to go away. I promise you, you are not going to be 80 years old and still be in jujitsu using your athleticism. It's just not going to work. So you can listen to us now or you can listen to us later, but you're going to listen to us or you're going to be out. And Master Sauer says that uh, people in Brazil, guys in Brazil, black belts in Brazil, they'll eventually retire because they're unable to keep up with the younger people because they're using their natural athletic ability all the time. And as Mark says, if you're not after that technique, if you're not trying to uh, chase after that technique and get it, uh, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to be in jujitsu when you're 70 uh -huh. and 60 years old. You will have just glory days where you're sitting on the couch going, wow, I was good at jujitsu and I won a medal or two, but you will not be in it forever. And that's the sad part is can't we just be in jujitsu forever? I mean, that that's what we want. That's the goal. And it becomes and it's because of technique that you will get to that age and still be in jujitsu. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like, you know, what you said, too, is like you're a big guy, obviously. And I, I'm pretty sure most people would be surprised to see you jump guard, at, you know, <laughs> It, you know, and it's like, oh, I expected you to just hold me down a cross side and not have a really good game. And you do have you have an excellent guard. And it's like, it's kind of a surprise. But, you know, I think just that one day you just, the, you know, people that are listening to this, someone is going to shut down your A game. It's going to happen. And you shouldn't be like, oh, no, what do I do now? You should have an answer it kind of in every single area, at least a pretty proficient one. So, yeah, learn from us now or go through a lot of injuries and, and wish you did later, you know. And I, yeah, and I think that's why it's such a such a huge part of your game that you should develop the ability to survive and defend yeah. everything. Because you're going to, you know, I'm always dealing with guys that are competitive, high level. They're fighting at a, a very high level. They're trying to grab. They're fast. They're strong. They're young. But they're always like, God, I cannot get past your guard. I can't do this. Like, yeah, because yeah. I developed it <laughs> to a way that I don't want you to get past. And right. and then I, then at the same time, I'll just roll up like a like an armadillo and let them do whatever they want. And they're like, can't catch you. They can't get you because you learn how to defend. And that allows me to to grapple every single day because I don't have to be on my my best physical feeling super sharp day. I can go in there and I'm a little tired little fatigue, mm -hmm. more up from the week, but I can grapple just the same because now I get to work my defense. I get to work my, my survival skills. I'm going to allow that person to try to do anything they can and then realize, man, I need to work this. I need to build up my defense. And, and that's something that Master Sauer has always preached, always have that ability to defend, always look for the ability to survive. And then a lot of times the other people get tired and they'll fall right into your trap. Mm-hmm. Happens all the time. Once the yeah. five, six, seven, eight minutes, they start getting tired, breathing heavy, and yeah, all the mistakes come out for sure. I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between the tournament side and the and the Gracie Jiu Jitsu side. These guys just spoke about it. Um, we in, in Gracie Jiu Jitsu, we want to be able to defend ourselves against somebody 50, 60, 70 pounds heavier mm -hmm. than us. Whereas in the tournament side, you're really going after somebody who might be five, maybe 10 pounds heavier in a tournament setting at a certain time limit where you got to take it to them. All right. And if, if you just imagine the worst, biggest, freakiest guy you've ever met and he attacks you, that's where Gracie Jiu Jitsu comes in. I mean, uh, Ma Grandmaster Elio, you know, he was 120 pounds. His defense had to be spectacular to be able to defeat those guys that were super big super heavier than he was and so that's the difference and when so if if we can fight somebody 50 60 pounds heavier than us uh defense plays a huge role just uh, at mm -hmm. the very least don't get caught you might not win 
just don't lose. And, and that's Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. and, and when you understand the, the, the differences, then you can play both games just easily and it's not a problem. But people always focus on the tournament side where it's go, 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 go. Well, how do you go against a big, huge guy way bigger than you? Yeah. Your A game gets shut down. Now you're on your back. Mm -hmm. You better learn to defend. Well, that's another thing. Like you said, the self-defense aspect of it, uh, there's the art to not losing. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's a huge thing that is ignored, I think, in a lot of academies across the country because they're so tournament oriented, because it's about the weight class. It's about, you know, you can't they don't even deal with striking or hits or what happens if you're in some strange or two on one or whatever. So there's an art to not losing, to being able to survive and getting away. And that's Absolutely. something that's really important to understand as far as that. And I tell people, hey, ultimately, Jiu-Jitsu was originally developed for self-defense. And mm -hmm. then it created the sport so they could have opportunities to try things and not always have that mentality that, okay, this is a life and death situation. But then it kind of did this flip over. And now it's like things that could never I mean, it would very rarely work in a street fight scenario against somebody who's tough. I mean, are, are like common strategies now. And yeah. so that's something that I tell the people, I don't care if you do this for sport. I don't care if you do this for whatever, but you have to understand what it was made for and you have to have that self-defense base. And that's a, that's a huge part of the game. I mean, that's the, the biggest part of the game. The rest is literally a game. And mm -hmm. it's a yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the self-defense kind of approach that we have, self-defense jujitsu does not mean don't compete. It means you have priorities in your defense first, and then you want to add everything else to it. You want to agree to a rule set, do it. You want to compete, do it. You should. But our, the first and foremost, when people come into our academy, first of all, I've never, and maybe you have, I, have, I, have, I don't think ever once, and I, I may be wrong, but I don't think so, I don't think I've ever had a student come in and say, I don't know any jujitsu. I don't know what it is, but I want to compete in it. <laughs> All of them say, I want to learn self-defense for wh whatever reason. I want to get in shape. I want to be more confident. I want to feel better. I want to be better. I want to do better. The self-defense part means, learn. like, for example, I had two students. They're both blue belts. One was a male. One was a female. The, the gentleman, he had a, a, a match. It was 90 minutes, an hour and a half. He was done after that. <laughs> he went home. And then uh, the, the second one was just recently, a young lady that uh, teaches here and helps, and she's a blue belt, and uh, she had a match that was an hour and 17 minutes. And from a, from a defense perspective of going into a match with someone that's 30-something pounds heavier, you last an hour and 17 minutes uh, defensively, that's impressive because mm -hmm. I don't really care about I mean, look, I want the person to win, but now when you're a purple belt and a brown belt and you have a defense like that, I can't even imagine what kind of a nightmare you're going to be when you start getting out there. But you want slow growth that's very solid in all areas as opposed to fast, gro fast growth that's amazing in just one specific area, in my opinion, right? Yeah. So, um, But the self-defense part does not mean don't compete. If you want to compete, compete. But we have to, like Greg said and, and Keith, these guys trained world-class people. You have to consider getting punched in the face or kneed in the ribcage or elbowed. And, uh, you know, or have people doing these bizarre things. And that's what the self-defense part of it is for, is survive first and then seize the opportunity the moment it's there. That's the essence of a real Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And yeah. I remember uh, Professor Sauer saying on this show that when competition kind of came out, everybody that was competing already knew the self-defense. So they were just adding another thing just to kind of do something fun and test it in a different way. But that didn't become the priority. And it wasn't like today, people that have never even done the self-defense and just, just going straight into competition and never even realizing what it was originally intended for and what's the biggest priority of it. Yeah, and I don't think one side needs to insult the other. They're both right. important aspects, but you Absolutely. just have to understand where the roots of the tree go. Exactly. I think this is something too that, you know, you take probably any of the you know decent competitive jujitsu guys they're going to be able to defend themselves pretty well they're competing oh. all the time all right but what about the student who watches them and tries to imitate but doesn't understand you know the self-defense and that's the that's the majority of the people that are coming in 
to the people that aren't going to compete constantly against really high level people and getting that pressure test constantly. They're just trying to figure out how to survive without all that person's attributes, physical toughness, mm -hmm. right? that mentality. And then they're kind of lost. All of a sudden they get attacked and they don't know where to go. So that's why I think that self-defense base is so huge. The ability to survive, the ability to defend and like for me right now, I, I look at stuff like this. I go, okay, what techniques could I work right now that would work in sport IBJJF where there's a whole bunch of rules? Or it's going to work no gi in like a, a naga or something where you can do all sorts of everything. Is it going to work in MMA mm -hmm. and in self-defense? If, if there are moves in each position that work in all those, that's my focus. Mm -hmm. that's what I nice. Think I can do. Awesome. I yeah. love it. I always tell people the difference between Gracie Jiu Jitsu and the sport Jiu Jitsu because they'll ask. And a lot of times they don't ask. They don't even know, and it takes them years to figure it out, is just add punches to your face, all right? If you want to know what Gracie Jiu Jitsu is, <laughs> just let me punch you in the face a few times, and you're <laughs> going to get it real quick. Um, and I, there's a story about Grandmaster that I want to tell, and I don't even know if this is true. So this could be just a fable, but somebody told me a long time ago, that somebody was uh, – there was this thing called the spider guard that had just come out at one time, and, and Grandmaster was doing a seminar, and a blue belt was asking Grandmaster about the spider guard. And Grandmaster kept putting it off and saying, uh, it's not a self – uh, he didn't like it. It's not a self-defense move. But the blue belt kept pestering him about it and going, hey, well, what do you mean? What, what would be your defense against my spider guard? Because that was the new thing coming out, and I remember when it came out. Mm -hmm. So he go finally Grandmaster was tired of listening to this blue belt. So he said, Hey, you know, he through an interpreter said, Hey, get me in spider guard. So the the uh, blue belt got him in this, this newfangled spider guard thing. And what Grandmaster did was he stood up, rotated the guy to the side where his head was to the side, and then Grandmaster took his foot and started stomping the mat right <laughs> by his face. And the nice. blue belt went, Okay, I, I understand the difference now between the self-defense. Uh, and the sport aspect of it. I, if you can take a foot to your face, uh, it's probably not a good self-defense technique. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. I don't know if that's true, though. I don't know. I, I That could be a made-up, but it's a great story, nonetheless. It is a great story. That I tell all the time, because it's legit. Well, Absolutely. It's, it's definitely legit, because, you know, think about all the rules that they even impose in within MMA now, that at one time weren't there, like stomping the guy's face in, kneeing him in the head when he was yes. in a bad position. Uh, you know, all these other things that, you know, you could never, that, that you can't do now, but at one time you could, and that changed the game. Think about the time when there was no wrap, no gloves on. So the punching was, you know, it was different. You could grab, I mean, like, okay, we got to take headbutts out because, that's wrecking a lot of people. Well, that stuff's going to happen. you got to figure mm -hmm. it out. And that's where all the, the original and really the, the straightforward, no-nonsense, Gracie combatives come in because it deals with those things and at least keeps you uh, aware of those things. And that's a huge part of it that if you're doing it for self-defense, which everybody should be, that should be part of your thing, all right, you have to address that. You have to address the realities of a, of a street fight, which is going to be super brutal and intense. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's get back a little bit to the mindset of lasting to well into our years. And Keith, I've heard in one of your, or seen one of, uh, in one of your videos where you said jujitsu is a marathon, not a sprint. And I'm sure others have said that as well, but talk a little bit about that guys, the mindset and, and how, important it is i've heard it said that we have to have a new definition of success or winning and kind of what we just talked about being more defensive and how important is that as we go further and further into our years well you, you see a lot of you see a lot of wrestlers i mean and they're in high school and then they might go to college wrestling but after after college or even after high school you don't see a lot of guys doing uh you know, uh, rest, get, get wrestling clubs going, you know, where they're into their 40s and 50s because it takes a lot of energy and a lot of aggression. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I totally like it. I love wrestling. I have a problem. However, if, if and, and then what they do is wrestlers, 
and Greg could probably talk more about this, but wrestlers will then switch it to jujitsu and they'll switch over to jujitsu. And that, then they think of it's more like uh, wrestling with submissions. And what will happen is if you keep that attitude as you grow, you know, if you don't grow old, don't even listen to me. Don't worry. If you're never going to grow old, don't listen to me. This is, that's bull, right? If you're young forever, if you're going to stay young, then you, you can go as hard as you want, right? Your arm falls off. Heck, it'll grow back, man. You're young. But as you get older, your attitude of training has to change, all right? And this is where the, the mindset of I defend myself first, then I can go on the attack. I like to think of myself this way, and this is my attitude. I'll be defensive, defensive, defensive. And I'll, I think of it like this, a tiger under in the brush, a tiger hiding, a lion hiding. You know, the lion doesn't just chase after the gazelle trying to get it. The lion will sit there and wait for the gazelle to come along. And when the gazelle gets close, then he'll spring on him. And that's how my, like per personally, as I'm 50 years old right now. So as I, I, I try to be more defensive and protect myself so I don't get injured. But when I see the right time, then the tiger comes out and I'll spring and get you. But if you're always trying to make things happen and you're not in a tournament setting, because I understand that, that there's a time limit there. If you're just on the mat, you don't have to go, go, go all the time. You can just wait, 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 defend, defend, defend. And then when you see your time, you act on it. Uh, like Greg said, like Greg said, when he was talking about Master Sour, they'll give you the sweep or the submission. They'll let you know, man. And you just, but you just have to be there to see it. And when you do that, Boy, you could train for a long time, but defense, I believe, is super important as you get into your older years. And man, when these 21 year olds can't catch you with anything, uh, it gets very frustrating. They just get mad going, well, why don't you do something? Well, dude, you're not letting me. <laughs> so I'm just going to stay here for a while and just protect myself. And then you sweep them all of a sudden and then they get mad. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, I like. Uh, Chris Howder, he has a great statement. It says, it, it's not who's good, it's who's left. Absolutely. And because you have a lot of guys that are just good and super strong and just explosive, and then they blow out something mm -hmm. and they get injured. Or they just can't keep up that pace like was alluded to before, and all of a sudden they start getting beat a little bit and they realize, man, I'm not as good as I thought, and they – they're not thinking long term. They're thinking about what's going to happen today. How can I win today? I got to be great today. And it's like, no, you don't have to be great today. You, you can you can be on the mat today. Imagine if you could be on the mat every day. How great you would be as time went by. And for me, I was kind of uh, like I always tell people. I, I got a point where I was forced to be old quick. And then I had to relearn, and I got back to being young again. Because when I came back from my cancer, I, could, I had to learn how to walk. And so now, you know, legs that were having a hard time walking, I had all this knowledge that I had to relearn and how to rebuild. And that could have been super frustrating and, and just like, man, I can't do this anymore. But it was like, hey, I did this before, step by step, you know, day in, day out, and it, I tell you, one thing, there's always a blessing behind everything. For me, I always tell people cancer was a blessing because I became more empathetic to people who didn't have natural ability because I lost a lot of my natural ability. I had to relearn how to do everything again. And so I had to be careful with where my legs were. I had to be careful where my position was because I didn't have that same explosive athleticism. I had to develop it over time but I developed it by really relearning jujitsu as a person who didn't have all the attributes that I once had. And I thought, to me, that ended up being a great blessing because now I understand so much more about how to roll, how to keep my body in a good position. And I remember Master Sauer said this once, if you're on the bottom, some sort of a guard or open guard or any kind of a guard, if you've got a guy that's on top of you that's 250, 260, 2 whatever, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he just dropped all his weight on you. What Ooh. would happen? Would you just get crunched like a piece of tinfoil and things start snapping and springs flying everywhere? <laughs> or would your body react like a spring, like it's supposed mm. to because you are in good position? Wow. And I've always thought about that because, you know, hey, because of wrestling, because of really high-speed training, I've already hurt my knees and did all this sort of stuff. I don't want that to happen anymore. 
So I'm always thinking, am I in that spring? Am I am I like a spring right now? Or am I like a twisted piece of steel that's about ready to snap? Mm. I want to be that spring. Yes. Yeah. Nice. I think, uh, too, you know, as and, you know, we could talk about as we all get older. I think we're all right around 50. I know I'll be and I know Keith is and I think you are, too. But um, is, I think we have to stop rating our success one class at a time and, and really look at it from like, how am I this year compared to last year, as opposed to thinking every you have to see this significant level of progress every single class. Um, it, you know, it's like, you know, how much better, how much do you need to be better every single day and the answer shouldn't be a lot because there's there's 365 days in a year so compare this year to last year and and see if you're better instead of instead of judging your success by how many people you beat and now as you get older too like your diet is very important like your body cannot regenerate as well from bad food you have to have you have to put good healthy nutritious food in your body in order to regenerate it and to build muscle because Good food will build uh, bones and muscle better than bad food. And you can't put anything in your body, mentally or physically, and expect to have a better outcome if what you're putting in is not good and it's not healthy. True. And, um, you know, rest, it's just rest. Getting enough rest is, rest is part of your training. Recu- recovery, recuperation is part of your training. Your diet is part of your training. So I think those are things that oftentimes people don't really even consider or, or don't think about or not even taught but you have to get an, in in order for you to to perform you need to get enough sleep and you need to put good food and good nutrition in your body and you know uh, as well as good thoughts in your mind because what you put in if it's positive it'll have a more positive outcome mm-hmm. if it's negative or it's detrimental it will have a more negative or detrimental outcome and i think it, while it's very, very simple um, it's not so easy and it's not something that's communicated to a lot of people that are getting into jiu jitsu that's a great point, Mark. And that, that goes along with just self-care in general. You know, as we get older, even off the mat, uh, taking care of yourself uh, is, is hugely important. And it certainly applies on the mat as well. Uh, I swear by massage and many other things to try to you know, kind of keep me going. But on the mat, I, I, I warm up, you know, three times as much as I used to. Because if I don't, you know, I'm going to jack myself up and tweak something that's going to bother me for a month, you know. So I think that's really important what you said and just, just to kind of echo on that. So. Yeah. You know, I, I have I have tendonitis in both of my arms. And that's have uh, as far as injuries lately. You know, I've had everything hurt in the past. Mm-hmm. But right now I suffer from tendonitis. And it's like, it's, it seems as you get older. My point of it is, is we are all in a injuries and you have to overcome those Mm -hmm. of which you are operating when you're on the bottom when you're on the top because like now i can't really push all that much so that forces to frame more which is exactly what jujitsu is is about framing not pushing so now i can't push so you have to if you have a knee injury you have to overcome that as well just because you're getting older, but you're still hurt, you have to overcome those with your limitations and change your jujitsu to fit around that. And I think if you'll if you'll keep that in mind, along with the good nutrition, like Mark was saying, and and maybe even some chiropractic, you you will see that you'll be able to last a lot longer. Uh, catastrophic injuries. Yeah, I think I think the part that Mark had alluded to as well is that a lot of people don't think about the recuperation, the recovery. They don't think about, hey, ultimately I'm doing the martial arts because I want to have more energy. I want to be healthier. I want to have more vitality in my life. If I'm walking around constantly nursing injury after injury and I'm not allowing myself to recover, I'm not eating healthy, I'm not sleeping like I should, Mm -hmm. all these things, all these things add up. And I think part of a, a big part of being able to be on the mat for a long time is knowing your body, knowing what you have to do, knowing what you should do to be healthier, to have more energy, to have that overall vitality. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle. It's not just how good I did on the mat today. It's like, man, this is a lifestyle. I want, when I go home, I want my life to be better because how I was on the mat today 
I want my ability to communicate with other people at a higher level because I was able to, you know, work my stress out and 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 I feel good about how I work at the, the academy today. And I think that's a huge part of it, you know, to be cognitive of your energy, of your health, of your vitality. Like I said, like uh, the diet's a huge thing. You can't out train your diet. That's yeah. true. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, like even just little things like if you have an injury and they are inevitable at some point, little ones, right? You should if you have major injuries and that's a common occurrence at someone's academy, then your training methodology needs to be addressed, in my opinion. Um, but if you have an injury, you can train around it. And, you know, um, we're all going to get small ones here and there, no matter what you do. But um, I think we have to resist the urge also, and I don't know about you guys, but from my experience, when someone is has some kind of injury, and it's almost always outside the academy from something else, and they come in and they're like, you know, I feel a little bit better. I want to roll. That's usually when the injury gets worse. You have to let yourself fully heal or recover from whatever it is that has happened before you really start getting into it. Or get with a training partner that you can genuinely trust where you, maybe you have to go smooth and flow until you – are better and then you can pick it up but what you don't want to do is be halfway healed and you start to feel better and then come in and make it worse and uh, i've seen that um over the years as well too so just wait until you're healed uh, heal you know you're healed but you if like i was just training with johnny carlquist at unified i, I think you guys know him and um yep. so he said hey listen my shoulder's a little sore i'm gonna put one hand in my belt and we're gonna train man we trained for 30 minutes it was great training i, I kind of laughed a couple times because i went for his arm and it wasn't there because he had a belt tied around it <laughs> and uh you know but you can train around it around certain injuries safely um but as long as you're with people that you can trust but some people uh you you can't train with and you got to know the difference and for some injuries you really can't move but you can still come in and take notes and you can learn and observe i mean there's other learning styles than kinesthetically getting out there and doing it so you can watch and take notes and start to analyze and you would be shocked at the details that you can get from just observation and, and taking good notes. I, I mean, what do you guys think about that? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, at our academy, if a person gets injured or whatever the situation, we always encourage them to come in. And yeah. when you come in, we make a big deal out of it. We're like, hey, you notice so-and-so, he's sitting on sidelines today because he got injured, but he's still here. He's still learning. He's still growing. He's still taking in the information that he has and that's going to come out later so take that take that advice from him come in get your training in use your mind you don't always have to be on the mat the other thing is as you said before training around injuries training with a good training partner knowing that you can trust the people that are on the mat with you are a big big deal because like you said all of us are going to have tweaks are going to have potential injuries but again there are so many different levels of training. You right. could do drilling, you could do flow training, you could do situations, you could put your hand in your belt, you could just work your guard without using your arms. You could be doing all defense, you could be you know, the list goes on and on. But if you don't have a culture that allows that, well, that's a huge part of your training that you're going to that you're going to miss. That's a big part of it because you're not always going to be healthy. You're not always going to be you know, feeling a hundred percent. And it's the same thing as when we got competitors that are getting ready to fight, they can't be injured going into that fight. Now we're in, you know, inside that window, we can still train and even the fight team will train together and they know, okay, Hey, X, this guy has a fight coming up. Allow him to get stuff. Don't it's not a fight right now. It's allowing yeah. him to train. It's allowing him to be at his best when the best is required. And that's a huge thing. And, it's about, again, being able to be on the mat for as long as you can to make it a lifestyle, not just this competition every day. Yeah. I mean, the warrior mindset, if you show up in every way you can, sometimes it's phys not physically on the mat, but there's other ways to show up. And I think it's okay to be selective in choosing who you're training or rolling with, even if you're not, of course, when you're injured, but even if you're not, if you know there's a person that seems to have one gear and no matter how much you know you try to work with him, he just can't seem to shut that down. You don't have to roll with everybody. If you know there's any kind of danger at all, be selective. It's okay. 
you want a challenge, tie your ankles together. That'll give you a challenge. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. When, let me just say this real quick. When I, I had hurt my knee uh, several years ago and I had to have a brace on it and I could hardly walk around, man. I had a straight leg going the whole time. And the only way I could train was side control bottom on one side. And mm. I can't tell you how I learned so much about movement, having one straight leg that I couldn't get somebody in the guard. And that just totally revolutionized my side control. So being injured uh, is not, not the end of the world. It, it, it can open up avenues for you that you never thought of before. Yeah, you might never think to even develop an attribute or a skill uh, otherwise because you yes. didn't have to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, I, I think you, for anyone that's listening to this, you can show up, even if it's not physically on the mat. I, what we're all getting at is you can show up, you can take notes, you can observe, you can listen, you can analyze, you can ask questions, you can ask why from a different perspective. So you can still learn. And, um, you know, most of us will probably call it a commitment, but I really like what you did, what you say, Greg, is like when people come in, that's the epitome of the example, the mental toughness that we want people to have and emulate is like, look, he or she can't train, but they're still here doing what they can. And uh, you can even coach your teammates if you can't train. So there's you can absolutely add value every time you're on the mat. Yeah, that was a like I said, probably the the silver lining. Around the, the, my cancer story is the fact that. I had to relearn how to do everything, and it gave me a real different perspective on how to move. I, I didn't have the ability to use my legs like I was supposed to. I didn't have the ability to be explosive. And, you know, again, starting with, with baby steps. Well, years later, I had a, we had a guy come in, and he was a, a older guy. He was a Vietnam vet. He got shot in one tour, shot in another tour. He was a cop. Ended up having five huge discs in his neck. His arm was crushed. I mean, he had everything going against him. And he, and he was working with one of the, the instructors who's more of a really a, a kind of a sport-oriented instructor. And he's like, I don't think I can do this. And I go, hey, how about you come in and I work with you for a little bit? Well, he is now a brown belt at the school. Wow. And nice. he is uh, 70 years old and still on the mat. He's had two shoulder replacements. I mean, he is, but he's still there. He's still able to move it. And he knows when he, ha how he has to move. And everybody around him is like, okay, hey, we're going with uh, so-and-so. We have to be careful with this and to train with them. And, you know, such a positive influence for the academy. And people look at that and go, man, if he can do it, why can't I? Exactly. What a story. Yeah. That's so great. All right. So. We're getting kind of close to our time, but we do have time for a little bit more, guys. So I just want to go back to the mindset because I really think that's at the heart, you know, the ego and the mindset. And, and you know, you can call it neuro associations or, or whatever you choose to call it. But when you're still having more fun times on the mat as if more than the non-fun times, you know, you're, you're probably going to you're going to have fun and joy and you're going to stay on the mat. But if that shifts and, you know, you're starting to have a lot more non-fun times, you probably won't stay long term. So I think part of that is developing the mindset of just like Grandmaster Elio, you know, success in his later years shifted to. I know you guys have uh, either all heard these stories or you might have even seen it in person. He'd get on his back, tell you to mount him and ask you to try to choke him. And he would just defend, defend, defend. And if he defended you for two minutes, you know, he might as well have submitted you or done whatever. Because to him, that was winning, that was success, and that was joy. So I think that's really important to redefine success or, or what brings us joy on the mat as we get well uh, in our years. I, I like what you said about having fun. And I, I think you just hit the nail on the head. Is if you're going to class... If you're going to class and have to sit outside and huff and puff, getting yourself ready because you're about to get killed by all these guys, I mean, that pretty soon, man, you're not going to like that over the years. But if you come to class and go, I'm just going to have fun if I get tapped, you know, whatever, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to submit people, but I'm not going to get hurt. And I'm, I'm going to go in there and, and just have a good time. You know, Master Sauer has made that clear to me. Just have a good time. And when your attitude is right like that and you get tapped and I've been tapped 10,000 times, man, I still have a good time. I don't care that you'll, you'll be more calm 
and able to deal because you have to be in the present when you're grappling with people. Mm -hmm. And if you're freaking out and panicking, your mind stops working. And then you're, you're just grasping for anything. You literally, when you're grappling, have to keep control of yourself. And, and I hate to say this, I, cause, it, but I say this, like, uh, the, have you ever seen the movie Terminator where in you, you saw the inside of the Terminator's head and it's going through with red, you know, things that it's adding everything up. Well, that's what you need to be is you're adding everything up in your head because you're focused on everything and you see everything at the, at that moment. Uh, but without having fun, man, it, it becomes a, um, it becomes a competition and then you're going to try the same old tired crap that you've always done and you won't get better. And it's about getting better. And I promise you, if you will have fun, hmm. things will be a lot easier and you will get good, man. And then it, then you'll put yourself in bad spots and you can't even get submitted. You'll even try to get submitted and you can't because you just miraculously get away. Surrender to the technique. Mm -hmm. Find the angles. All right. Find the angles that work. Find, you know, find the muscle groups and attack those, the, his weak muscle groups with your strong ones. That's the technique that you have to have if you're going to be grandmaster's age training. Well, and, I, and I'd like to just, you know, kind of add, first of all, what you said, a thousand percent. Um, I told, if you're not having fun, what are you doing? Right. And now, you know, how do you learn what is fun? Right. And I think that's part of our job as instructors is to say, okay, you don't know that rolling and and get having an intense physical workout is supposed to be fun and getting caught is fun and you shouldn't get upset. And that's totally like an acceptable norm in a jujitsu academy. And because I think oftentimes, and I hear these from students like, I can't believe I got caught today. I'm like, oh man, that's awesome. You got it's excellent. Awesome. Yeah. So let's try to make it a little bit less next time. And then turn 30 seconds into 45 and, you know, get one breath and you get one breath, you get a moment, you get a moment, you get an opportunity, you get an opportunity, you either take it or make another one. And so I think part of our uh, responsibility is to cultivate the mindset as people assimilate into the mental toughness of jujitsu that, okay, well, man, you survived. Good for you. Are you injured? No. You have a good time. Awesome. They don't know very often in the beginning that getting caught and having good roles and last is fun. And when you're taught that that is the necessary process in jujitsu to get better, it's like this great sense of relief overcomes people. And then they're like, man, I don't care if I get caught because I'm supposed to. And then now, based on what you guys said and we're talking about, you come in, you learn how to move. Yeah, you're supposed to get caught. That's part of jujitsu, man. That's part of the process. They don't feel bad about it. They're not overcorrecting. And then three, six months, 12 months later, getting caught is just not even a big deal. It's just part of what they do. And um, they don't, they're not judging themselves by how many, because listen, you guys, were, you know, high level black belts. I've been a black belt for five, going on six years. I can't even count how many times I've been submitted in jujitsu. And um, I think students find a great sense of relief knowing that you're supposed to along the way. And then hopefully it gets less, but um, jujitsu does get a little easier the longer you do it, but it's always very challenging, I guess is what I, the way I'd put it. What Master Sauer says is, and I listen to this all the time, what is hard today will be easy tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if you just understand and believe that, you're, you will become a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. But there, there's some bumps and bruises along the way and there's getting submitted. I mean, I've never met anyone who's never been submitted in jiu-jitsu. <laughs> no, exactly no. right. Yeah, I that's think, for sure. I think part of the, big thing too is just you know in your classroom you have you, we talk about it as far as uh running the classroom you got to have your students they're, they're going to be sweating they're going to be smiling they're going to be learning right the class pyramid and they got to be having that happen all the time so we do a lot of games you know i i have a a day that okay we're going to grapple but everybody's got to hold racquetballs in their hand so now they can't <laughs> grab so you got to play that game and they also do the one okay you got to one, one guy's going to choose who's going to be the one who puts the, their arm in the belt. All right? Okay, we're starting. You know, so we have to do that to, to have fun. And then they realize, you know, hey, when I have a, a situation where I may be a little bit less able to to do my full jujitsu game because I only have one arm, there's a much higher probability that I'm probably going to get caught or I figure out how to play. And the other thing is for us is – we don't make it a big deal at all if someone is, is, is submitted. It's like, hey, if you're not tapping, you're not trying. You're not trying to do things. Nice. So you gotta you gotta you gotta open up and 
fry stuff. Just think, I always tell people who are new and people who are trying new things at any level, hey, have a plan of action, try to execute the plan, and when it doesn't work, now you know why it didn't work. But if you just try to wing it and hope for the best, well, you're not going to learn anything. So yeah. It's not about not trying things. Just kind of think about what you're going to try, good, bad, or ugly. And then you go, well, that, that didn't work out so well. That, that kind of caught me in a bad position. And then you just go, okay, what do I got to do next time? As opposed to, like, uh, you know, just staying into that, that A game because I can't be beat. I won't be beat. Mm. You know, no, that's nonsense. Yeah, well, I'm, always, I'm always talking at the end of class, you know, hey, who got tapped today? Everyone raised their hand. I said, awesome. That means everybody's doing great. All that's right? That's cool. Who did, and then I go, who didn't get tapped? Who usually gets tapped? Hey, that's awesome. You guys are doing great. <laughs> you know so it's like everybody's doing great as long as you're on the mat and yes it. for sure so so it's one thing though for for someone that's fairly new to kind of grasp okay I'm, I'm that's part of it i'm supposed to get tapped and that's okay they can accept that a lot of times but what about someone who's been on the mat for years had a great mindset kept it playful but still you know took care of business when they needed to and had confidence but they're on the downhill slide and, and maybe they're getting discouraged because they just can't do what they, they used to. And then tapping, I don't know, might, might take on a whole different meaning. Have you guys had any examples of people you've known that were in a similar situation? And if so, you know, what's your advice to, to anyone like that? Um, you know, I think that, you know, as you, as you progress and as you age, I think I always tell people, Hey, sometimes, well, almost all the time, your biggest competitor is going to be yourself. Mm. And and don't worry about what happens with the person across from you. Think about how did I do today? What did I what did I come out of here learning today? Did I do what I wanted to do? Was, did I get do I get to go home and feel happy about the fact that I was able to come in and roll? And I always think of this too. Like uh, Guru Dan Anasanto is a great example. He did not start doing jujitsu until he's in his sixties. Yeah. Wow. And now he's a black belt, and he's still rolling. He's still on the mat. He's still drilling. He makes sure he's always getting his privates in. And his whole thing is he's, he looks at almost all martial arts like a, with a kindergartner's mindset. He'll, he'll show little videos like, wow, did you just see this? This is unbelievable. And you're looking at it. Like, uh, that's great. Guru, that's, a, that's an arm bar from the guard. I, I know, but look at it. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, it's like, man, that's that's what I want in my 80s, to be able to look at something and go, this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, yeah, Guru, it's a jab. I know, but look at it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's great. Man. He's amazing. Yeah, for sure. What a uh, mindset, right? What an yeah. incredible mindset. Yeah. I mean, he moves like a cat still to this day. It's impressive. Well, I think, you know, um, I'll just jump in for a second. But, you know, like as you get older, too, no one's going to have your jujitsu story but you. Right. And so I think it's important that we really come to terms with you are not going to be like anybody but you. And I mean, you know, and there's lots of, you know, kind of quotes and sayings, but really no one will ever have your story. And that's the bottom line. No one will have your experiences like you do uh, or come close except for you. So, you know, just do like you got to just really genuinely understand that you, you, as long as you do the best you can and you show up, that's all anyone can ever ask for you. And, you know, deep down to the fiber of your being, whether you know whether you really genuinely put forth the best that you can. And if you do that, I don't see how anyone could ask any more of you. And, you know, now whether that means you get tapped a little bit more as you get older. OK, that's fine. That's just, you know, age is a natural progression of life, it's just mm -hmm. like everything else. So. Um, you have to come to really good terms with your own kind of story experiences and you just have to really accept kind of who you are and that it's part of the process because we're all going to get older and all the, the only thing that we can do is pass on what we know to the people that will remain here when we're gone. And so um, I wouldn't take, you know, I would say don't take yourself so seriously. Just kind of lighten up. It's life. You're not getting out alive. You might as well have fun along the way. Yes. And uh, who cares if you get submitted because in the grand scheme of your life, what does it really mean if you tap to an arm bar? Doesn't mean much. Um, what does it mean if you show up every day? It means a lot more than tapping to a single arm bar every now and then. So um, that's just kind of, you know, what my, the advice I would give to someone is just accept your story. 
I, I want to make sure everybody too understands about the training concept as you get older. This doesn't mean that you can't be aggressive and go out and get somebody. Oh, absolutely. But you you got to take it. You, you you just have to prioritize your training. There are some days that I'm super tired that I'll just go defend, no problem. And then there are other days where I'm feeling feisty and everybody's getting full rhino, man. <laughs> and I go and I go out and I am trying to kill you. Then there are other days where I want to work on just a triangle. So I'm going to get everybody in triangle. So I, I prioritize what I'm going to do. And some days I'm just so tired that I don't, I even don't want to train, but I force myself to go train, but I go, Hey, I'm just going to be defensive and, you know, and work through that. Or in some days I'm going to go put myself in an arm bar and try to escape that arm bar. Sometimes it doesn't work out, but a lot of times it does. So you just have to prioritize. It doesn't mean you can't go hard, but mm -hmm. I'll guarantee you this. If you're getting up there in age and you go hard every single time you will not survive in jiu-jitsu so you just gotta you gotta take your training and method methodology uh mm -hmm. so that you get the most out of your training without having to uh without having to endanger yourself every single night that's no good man yeah and let me be clear too well, i'm not saying to just graciously accept the climb you're supposed to push yourself as much as you can in every area and do the best you can but absolutely you know, yeah the age is inevitable but listen we're still going to bring our game you know when we train and yes. um, we can't do it you can't be 100 percent 100 percent of the time so you just have to be smart about it and uh, yeah i fully support what you're saying keith absolutely great perspective coach greg you too oh, you do percent because man there's days i get in there it is on and <laughs> guys are like what in the heck is going on i go dude imagine you, you are 35 years younger than me. What is your issue? And, and then I can chide them. I can goof around with them. I can have a blast in there. And then, but at the same time, they got to be looking at and going, God, he's kind of right. What the heck's going on? <laughs> yeah. and so I'm like, and, hey, but I have those days. Those days are going to come and I'm going to take advantage of them. I'm going to milk it a second of it. <laughs> and, and out on the street, you got to be able to take it to somebody. So yeah, just having that training in there uh, helps your street game a lot. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I agree. You know, we, we are, it is inevitable that, that things slow down. We have to have some changes going on. But uh, I think we all share the, uh, the notion that we want to defy the odds. I think if you have mm -hmm. a goal to be on the mat well into your years and into your 90s, you, you're going to be one of those people that – aren't going down easily that you want to keep it and uh, you're going to do everything you can to, to stay vital and vibrant. So anything, any closing thoughts from each of you before we wrap it up? I mean, you know, just I, I, if, all I can ask is that someone listens to this over. And if you take anything out of this, look at people that have been training for a long time. And if you want to train a long time, learn from their mistakes instead of really making your own. Don't wait for an injury or a crisis to say, oh man, I wish I should have listened. Those guys were right. Um, just just show up and keep showing up. And rule number one in martial arts is show up. Rule number two is show up when you don't feel like it. And number three is show up when you really don't feel like it. <laughs> because everybody feels better after they go to class. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't want to go, but that's where your discipline kicks in. And um, But you got to know yourself too. And you know, just push yourself and respect yourself enough to push yourself to achieve and to eat well and to think well and to sleep and rest well and recover well. Um, if you really respect yourself, you're going to treat yourself. You're going to take good care of yourself. And uh, we'd love for it to see you somewhere in the future on a mat at, at, after you listen to this or you learn some good lessons and you share them. But that's it for me. So I am just grateful to be on this podcast and uh, especially with Keith and Greg. So thank you very much. Well, let me jump in right now so Greg can have the last word. Uh, I want to give a shameless plug to my new book, From the Ground Up. This talks about a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today, how a new person or even an intermediate person can survive in jiu-jitsu because I think it's really important. And it talks about the uh, physical, the mental, the emotional, as well as the political aspects of surviving in a school. Uh, and I appreciate uh I appreciate it if you buy it because and, and, and or send it to somebody because I really think it can help. Other than that, surrender to technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to say that, hey, it's not that you're going to do great every day. It's that you do every day and that you're in and on the mat. It's an experience, and that's what you're there for. You're there to experience growth. You're there to experience the ups and downs. You're there to experience how to engage against all these different 
situations that may happen and have fun with it. Know that, hey, you're going to have good days. You're going to have days that you feel a little bit less than stellar, put it that way. And But the fact is that you're there. And I always tell people, I don't think you ever go home saying, man, I wish I never would have went in. But I can guarantee you say, man, I wish I would have gone in. Mm-hmm. And so true. Don't make, just, just go in. And I guarantee as soon as you get in, man, when you leave, your day's a better day. You're, you're, you're looking at things in a different perspective than you had before. And I think that's the value of training. The, the, the value of training is not that you're learning how to kick someone's ass. You're, the value of training is that you are becoming a, a better person, physically tougher, mentally tougher, emotionally tougher, more adaptable. You're able to see things more clearly with less stress. And again, having a healthy lifestyle is huge. Making those habits that give you more energy, that give you more vitality in your everyday life, that's what it's about. And I think that jujitsu is such a huge part of that because it allows you to to come in and be able to deal with however you're feeling and you can still do stuff. And that's the difference between like jujitsu and like wrestling or jujitsu or like Thai boxing or jujitsu or like a lot of other arts. You can come in and you can go nice and easy. You can just drill. You can you can be defensive. You can be offensive. You can go with how you're feeling and you'll always walk out feeling better. And that's that that's the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. Nice. So true. Man, some really good perspective and insights from you guys. I really appreciate it. My last word, and Keith, I will definitely put a link to your book in the show notes. So my last word, I guess, will be, you know, I think first we need to, first and foremost, have a goal and plan to roll into our later years. And and then that goal leads to the uh, plan, and the plan leads to the mindset, which dictates strategy and execution of our training. So I think, like you guys, keep it lighthearted, show up. Don't take it so seriously, but continue to grow on and off the mat. So I want to thank you guys so much. Really appreciate what you guys are doing and what you bring to jiu-jitsu and the lives that you impact on a daily basis. So thank you for your time and insights and perspective. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, this is so cool. Yeah. All right. I wish you guys long, healthy, and happy lives. Stay on the mat. Take good care. All right. Bye, guys. Take good care. And you. All right, really enjoyed that discussion. What a great group of minds. What a great group of professors to to have that discussion with. I feel very honored and fortunate to have been a part of it. If you haven't heard Professor Keith Owen's solo episode or Professor Greg Nelson's solo episode, certainly check out those great episodes in themselves. Professor Mark Cookrow has been on the show several times with discussions as well as doing the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. So he's an ongoing contributor to the show as well. All right. Have you checked out the Breathing for BJJ program? The Breathing for BJJ program is a 31-day online video program designed to transform your jiu-jitsu experience through the power of the breath. Have you ever felt panicky in certain positions, like being crushed on the bottom of a large training partner, perhaps? Or maybe you've found yourself holding your breath or over-breathing during heavy training or rolls. This program will take your functional capacity to breathe to an extremely high level. It uses a biomechanical approach and shows you how to target and strengthen your specific breathing muscles. Through an active and dynamic protocol, You'll learn to optimize your breathing and increase your breathing efficiency and effectiveness 100%. It's time to put more fun and more joy back into your jiu-jitsu. Check out the Breathing for BJJ program at www.breathingforbjj.com. All right, up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Because the idea isn't going to execute itself. 
and, and the book isn't going to write itself and the, the weights out in the gym, they're not going to move themselves. You have to do it and you have to do it now. Life happens for you. It happens for you. Opportunities will come to you every day. It's either for you, you can remain scared of the opportunities or you can embrace them and take them. Getting better isn't a hack or a trick or a one change that you need to make. Getting better is a campaign. It's a campaign. It's a daily, a weekly, it's an hourly fight. An incessant fight that doesn't stop against weakness and against temptation and against laziness. It's a campaign of discipline. It's a campaign of hard work and dedication. If you give up on your dreams, if you give up on your dreams, what do you have left? Nothing. If you get a compelling vision and you got strong enough reasons that will push you through the tough times, you're going to do things other people don't do. Sacrifice, consistency, struggle, gets you greatness. It's not what you're capable of. It's what you're willing to do. Again, what is your excuse? Why are you stopping yourself? Believe to achieve, dream big. Don't let anybody talk you out of your scores and your dreams. You've got to take action. You've got to ignore everyone else. And you've got to... Love yourself, trust yourself, listen to yourself, and follow your gut. That's the thing. Success and failure are generally slow processes. You want to get better? You want to self-improve? Stop looking for a shortcut and go find your alarm clock and find your discipline and find your guts and your passion and your drive and find your will. If you want to truly become successful, you have to be willing to pay the price with a 100% non-negotiable commitment. And you've got to go through a simple process fundamentally to make that progress. First step, vision that's compelling. Second step, make sure that there's strong enough reasons to follow through. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page and the link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat. <laughs>